good morning. I am Tiffany Tarpley in for Jerry Anderson on this Sunday edition of Leading Edge. And as we know, this is a time of year where so many people in our community truly give back, but help is needed all year long. Joining me now is Rob Dotson with Master Fluid Solutions in Perrysburg. Rob, thank you so much for joining the show. Thank you. Yeah. And so I have to say that I met you and Eric uh, at a grocery store and I was really in awe. I mean, I could tell that you all were doing really something special and probably doing something to give back to the community. Talk a little bit about the work that you all do to give back in our community. Sure. When I, uh, I saw you at the grocery store, I kind of looked back and felt bad because we had two carts full of food and groceries for uh, uh, an event that we were holding and raising food and money for the MLK Kitchen for the Poor. It's one of the, the many things we do locally here. So, yeah. And so Master Fluid Solutions in Perrysburg, we know it's an international chemical company in the metalworking industry, but um, talk about this uh, effort that you all put together to give back. How did it get started? Well, our founder, Clyde Sloon, was big on charitable giving, and that's one of our core values. So uh, probably about five, six years ago, we kind of uh, got a team together to uh, pare down the list of well over 100 charities that we supported over the years and kind of come up with a select few that we would uh, support and uh, hold events for, that type of thing. And, and talk about some of these events. I mean, when I saw you, you were collecting food. Um, is that is that what you do mostly is collect food to give to these organizations or food banks, or is it more than that? Uh, it's much more than that. That's just one of the events. We do that one time a year. Uh, we've been working with the MLK Kitchen for the Poor for a number of years. You know, sometimes we join their bowling event and, you know, with COVID, they haven't had that. So we thought we wanted to do something to help them in place of that. So uh, we have some very generous employees here at... Uh, you know, brought in a bunch of food items and uh, donated a lot of money that we were able to present to them. You know, along with that, we have, uh, we support uh, some local families around the holidays uh, by providing gifts for those who are less fortunate. And, uh, you know, that's been a big event. You know, we've been doing that for, oh, maybe more than 10 years now. So that's a lot of fun. Again, everybody's generous and, you know, we uh, get to deliver, you know, all kinds of gifts to these. Uh, basically, we go through schools to get the families to, to give to. So. Do you kind of learn something new um, in doing this, or have you learned something new or something different in doing this for the past five or six years? I can only imagine, you, know, you think you know what the need is within a community, but until you're really in it and you see it, it probably feels different. It does. You know, we're much more fortunate, I think, than uh, what many people would believe, and it's just good to give back. Uh, sometimes people are just down on their luck, or, you know, you just, it's an eye-opening experience to see how many people out there, you know, outside of the food drive and some of the other charities that we support that truly are in need of our help, so. Um, and, you know, I, what, I, what I love is the idea of um, helping others and paying it forward. If someone is watching this and they're kind of in awe of what you all are doing, how would you tell them to go about, like, if they're thinking, boy, I want to start like something like this at my job, what's the best way to get started? Well, uh, we took the list of uh, all the charities and made sure, you know, they were a 501 3C organization, a nonprofit, and uh, kind of separated them on different uh, categories. You know, does this help people, animals? Uh, is it more of an art? Uh, whatever the, the category was. And then we started scoring. We had a, a weighted system to get uh, uh, all the organizations together. Uh, basically, what percentage of the money given would actually go to helping people? You know, we don't want to pay uh, for every dollar, have 90 cents go towards overhead and so forth. You know, while that's important to keep some of these organizations running, we really want to have an impact on the people themselves. Uh, another key category was uh, we wanted to, uh, reach the hearts and minds of our employees. You know, we once we got the list down to about 10 charities, we reached out to our, our team and had them vote on who they wanted to support. Uh, one of those organizations is a local charity, Encourageous Community Services. Uh, they're out of White House, Ohio, and uh, uh, we were able to give our time and money. So if you don't, don't have the money to donate, we can always volunteer to go out there. And... Uh, then we have a national charity and workshops for warriors. Uh, and that of course aligns with our business. They uh, 
train veterans in advanced manufacturing and also help place them in jobs uh, nationwide. So that helps us to be able to reach out to our suppliers, our distri uh, distributors who we sell through, uh, and then we can get uh, you know our sales team involved that way to help uh, raise money for them. So. And you know, I I know that what you all are doing is important, right? And um, but but you you also kind of make it fun for the employees, from what I understand. That sometimes there are some competitions between different groups and different teams. Yep, we always create teams, uh, typically two, three, four teams on how we do this, and uh, you know, it gets pretty competitive. You know, nobody wants to lose. You know, ultimately, you know, the real winner is those who are getting the money and the food. But uh, you know, it makes it fun, and uh, every year we keep. Uh, you know, getting bigger as far as amounts uh, of money raised and the amount of food items. So uh, I always try to make it a competition and uh, that seems to help quite a bit. Yeah. Um, is there anything else you want to say or you think it's important for people to know? Uh, you know, we keep it fun. You know, that's part of the competition aspect of it. Uh, everybody wants to help, of course, but uh, we keep it, uh, our employees engaged. You know, we donate to the charities that they bring to us, you know, we'll take a look at it. So I think the important thing is keeping your employees engaged and, uh, you know, keeping it fun. All right. Well, Rob with Master Fluid Solutions, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Great. Thank you. All right. So coming up, the holidays aren't always a joyous time. We're going to have some tips for you this time of year to help, especially if you're dealing with loss. Well, it is the holiday season, and for so many people, it means joy and giving, but we also know that this time of year can be very difficult. So to talk a little bit more about that, joining me this morning is Ohio Guidestone therapist, Shelly Kepford. Shelly, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. And so when we talk about that difficulty, especially this time of year, it often surrounds loss. Is that something that you see with people? Yes, we see this we see this on a daily basis with people and especially people who are struggling around the holiday time with grief and loss. And the holidays just aren't a time of joy for everyone, right? And especially those grieving the loss of a loved one. So the feelings of grief um, are completely normal. And um, why not take the time to express emotions? And I'm coming to you from the Expressive Arts Program at Ohio Guidestone by creating something that's very uh, meaningful and long lasting. That's, that's very interesting. Can you talk a little bit about that program and using arts to help people uh, cope with grief? Sure, so uh, at Ohio Guidestone, we offer um, a grief and loss art group and the ideas, the activities can be done in memory of a loved one over the holidays. And um, it, it meets on a weekly basis and they are closed sessions that, we, that meet like every eight weeks. So the same people are in the group, which is really great because people can um, really uh, get into the understanding of what grief means to them. And because because everyone's personality is different in the way in which they deal and manage grief. Um, so we provide a bunch of different, it's like a hybrid approach where you take the arts and counseling and merge them together. And you, um, you provide a lot of different art activities to help people heal. It could be poetry, singing, dance, storytelling. Um, and one of the activities I'm thinking of in general is a shadow box activity where it's not necessarily the end product, which it never is, but it's the process of actually creating the art that helps people heal and get in touch with the memory, with the understanding of, of um, the loss. So it's really, really a great program. And people come away from that with having tools in their toolbox to deal with grief and loss better. And, and how, how do you know that it's time, you know, there are so many people who experience loss. Um, how do you know when it is time to seek help and maybe do group therapy? Because people, I'm, I'm assuming a lot of people think I could just get through this on my own. Absolutely, absolutely, Tiffany. So what we do is we, you know, we have intake on, on folks here at Ohio Guidestone, and then when there is an issue of grief and loss that comes up, then we, we can kind of help them understand if individual or group is better. 
Um, a lot of times having the support of other people who have gone through similar things is very beneficial for folks because they often feel alone. And that creates a very debilitating feeling of sadness and hopelessness. So the group setting is very uplifting and encouraging, but we also provide the individual sessions as well. And, um, you know, I do kind of want to talk about like if, if someone isn't necessarily ready for the group, their, their uh, sessions or coming in for therapy, are there some things that we can do uh, this time of year or think ways we can think or, or activities at home we can do to kind of oh, help sure. getting through this grief? Oh, absolutely. I mean, folks don't have to contact Ohio guys don't get the help that they need with all the stages of grief that people sometimes go through. Um, with the shadow box activity, just as an example, just going through and leaping through photographs of, of, of um, family members and doing that with the family will oftentimes just present a very warm, warm feeling for people grieving. And it's just kind of opening up that dialogue that sometimes people will push down inside, which can oftentimes cause depression and feelings of hopelessness where it's very difficult to come out of sometimes, which is where the additional help may come in. But writing a letter to a loved one or just creating as a family, even folks could create um, like memory rocks and put them in their garden or even going to the dollar store and just picking out little things that would remind them of, of their lost loved one and just getting together and kind of having like a, a memory activity. Yeah, that, that's very different. And, you know, you, you think about activities around this time of year, you know, so many dinners, so many gatherings to go to. Um, what does someone do if they aren't really feeling up to going to a family gathering after dealing with loss? Um, should they still go? Should they push themselves? Or, you know, how, how do they say no? Well, everyone is different with the way in which they're grieving. And I'm sure with some folks, it's very difficult to um, make up their minds if that's something that they would like to do. But just kind of reaching out to the other family members for support and just kind of seeing how they feel about it. And people, from my understanding and working with people, shouldn't feel forced, but just having the support of their loving family members around them may actually benefit them, even though they might not feel like going. Is there anything you else you wanna say or you think it's important for people to know when it comes to grief around the holidays and dealing with that? Just having patience with each other, compassion and kindness, um, above all everything else, just understand that the person who's grieving is not the only person that's grieving and just having the loving support of the family members around them can really be an amazing uplifting experience over the holidays and it doesn't have to be like a doldrum. All right. Well, Shelly Kepford with Ohio Guidestone, thank you so much for your time. Thanks a lot, Tiffany. Have a good day. You too. We'll be right back. Well, our next guest is an author who is telling the story of Unsung Heroes, America's First Paramedics. Uh, Kevin Hazard, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah, I, I really appreciate this because um, you're doing so much to tell this untold story. Talk a little bit about your book, American Sirens. Yeah, well, you know, I came across the story. Um, somebody asked me if I'd ever heard of Freedom House. I had spent a 10 year, it's gonna be 10 years as a paramedic, and I had never heard this before. So, you know, I was so, kind of shocked, um, was kind of amazed when I got into it. And essentially, you know, what it is, is in 1965, if you had a medical emergency, chances are the people who showed up at your house, if you called for help, would be two undertakers in a hearse. Well, all that changes in, you know, in the mid 60s, when this Austrian anesthesiologist by himself creates the world's first paramedic curriculum. And that alone would be incredible, because it kicks off this thing that forever changes the way lives are saved around the world. But what really makes this an incredible and truly unique American story is he partnered with a nonprofit in the city of Pittsburgh, in the Hill District. And the result of that partnership was that the world's first paramedics were 24 black men from the Hill District. 
Wow. And that's something I think a lot of people didn't know. <laughs> I know I sure didn't before I didn't. Um, hear, hearing about your book. What was that like for you telling this story and hearing the stories of those involved? Well, I mean, again, having done this for a decade, you know, these guys are my forebears, you know, like I, I, this is where I come from that, that job you know, profoundly changed who I was. You know, you, you talked a little bit oh, about their story. Uh, Oh. Oh, sorry, I, I interrupted you. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay, no problem. Um, you know, I just felt this tremendous sense of responsibility to tell this story. And so it was just an it was an honor not only to dig into it and to be able to bring it to a wider audience, but also to get to spend some time with them. Yeah. And um, you know, you talked about this touching on issues like system systematic, uh systemic, excuse me, racism. Talk a little bit about that. I mean, what kind of issues did they face? Well, I mean, they were a boatload. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of things that we see today, but, you know, they they had tremendous pushback from the police. You know, these were guys from a neighborhood um, with a long history of acrimony with the police department. The police made their jobs very difficult. They had trouble with the city government, both on the county level and the city level. Not all of it was purely medical. You know, some of the pushback was that the people bringing this medical revolution to the world um, were from a neighborhood that you know, the city really um, didn't think very much of. And and then they also had to deal with problems from, from their patients. You know, some of their patients were white and they had instances in which, uh, you know, people would say, I don't want you to touch me. I don't want you to do this. And they would have to have a discussion with someone to say, well, you now have to make a choice. It's either, you know, you risk the chance of dying or you allow me to touch you. Um, you know, those are almost unbelievable things to, you know, to wrap your head around as a medical provider. And of course, they come into context of the 60s in which the world is changing and, you know, the immediate effects of things like urban renewal are out there. And, you know, the, you know, redlining has just kind of come to an end. Covenants are being removed from neighborhoods. So it's kind of this new world that's beginning to emerge, a very difficult one. And, you know, these guys are on the front lines of this thing that, you know, literally changes the world. Yeah. And, and, and when you talk about some of that systemic racism, it it's almost sounds like some of the things you hear about today. Um, do you see that, too? I mean, I, you know, yeah. you being a, a paramedic or yeah, once I, it a was um, in a way it was kind of frustrating, like how little things have changed, you know, in all these years. You, when I was doing this research, I thought, you know, I, I, we were sort of in the wake of of everything that had happened with, you know, Black Lives Matter and George Floyd. And so that was happening. The pandemic was happening. You know, part of, of this history is is getting people to accept you know, changes in how medicine is performed and, and watching the skepticism that was exhibited over this new brand of medicine and has it had been through the, you know, through history was was kind of shocking. But then just the issues they were dealing with, we those are conversations we're having today. And it's, you know, almost 50 years later. Um, you know, Kevin, you talk about this happening in Pittsburgh, but there is an Ohio connection as well. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of things. One is um, Peter Saffer, who, again, the Austrian anesthesiologist who moves to America, events CPR, and then later creates a paramedic, helped create the National Registry of EMTs, which is in Columbus, Ohio, and that today um, remains the, the biggest professional organization for EMTs. And that started in Columbus. And then also uh, Freedom House is one of their very first paramedics, um, their very first director of operations when in 1975, he moved to Ohio and he was the public safety director in Cleveland. He was a public safety director in Columbus and he went on to be a politician, um, uh, lived a very, you know, uh, interesting life. And he's, he's just recently retired, but his name is Mitch Brown. And, you know, he's had a profound effect on on several different uh, Cleveland cities as, as well as uh, the larger state. What do you want people to, to to walk away with after after reading your book? What do you want them um, to take from it? The perseverance. You know, there are several things. You know, these guys showed up every day, quite literally inventing a new job. Every time they went to work, they were doing something that nobody had ever done before. So they had to create this new branch of medicine, but they had to do it in the face of hurdles that nobody should ever have to deal with. And yet they did it with grace. There's not a single count. In, in all these you know, thousands of newspaper articles, there's not one account of them behaving badly. 
And the fact that they were able to do that, show up every day, do an incredibly difficult job, I can tell you, it's a really hard job um, in the face of what they had to deal with and to do it with such grace and such care um, and to succeed as wildly as they did. I mean, that that to me is the takeaway, is the perseverance of these guys who did this. I absolutely love this. Um, is there anything else you want to say or, or talk about where people can find your book as well? Yeah, well, you can, you know, it's it's on sale everywhere. So you can, uh, you know, online, in the store, however you want to do it. Um, you know, the other thing is I, I would just say that, uh, you know, in, in the mid-1960s, a, a group of people um, answered a call for help. And, you know, in so doing, they forever shaped how EMS is run from the color of the ambulances um, to how the ambulances are designed, to how paramedics are trained, to the equipment they use, whether that be Narcan or intubating or all these other things. Um, it's a it's an incredible legacy that has been overlooked until now. Um, you know, and I, I hope that people will take some time to look at this because uh, the people who did it you know, are very proud of what they've done. And they are, you know, the only thing they ask is that uh, we take a minute to recognize them. I love it. Well, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Kevin Hazard, author of American Sirens. We'll be right back. Well, thank you so much for joining us for this Sunday edition of Leading Edge with Jerry Anderson. I'm Tiffany Tarpley. Have a great day.